Helene and, and Isabel, thank you so much for their help with that. I wish we had more time, but we've run over. So we will have to, uh, we'll have to uh, say goodbye to our Africa Rice colleagues. Uh, we encourage you to stay on for the other sessions. Please, colleagues online, uh, please feel free to reach out to our Africa Rice colleagues to ask all those questions that uh, we didn't get time to cover in today's session and to continue the conversations, uh, not just for today, but for the rest of the year. As we've noted, time is advancing. Uh, so um, hello, if free colleagues, it's lovely to have you with us. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are, for those who are joining us for the first time today. You're very welcome to this Marathon Spotlight event, which is taking us on a 13 hour journey around the globe. Uh, today, uh, along with a lot of other people around the world, we're celebrating International Day of Women and Girls in Science. And we're taking the opportunity to celebrate our own fantastic community of women scientists who are leading the way, we've seen that throughout today, leading the way in a wide range of research and scientific innovation, breaking barriers and finding new ways to advance the transformation of food, land and water systems in climate crisis. For those I haven't had the pleasure to meet before, my name is Fiona Farrell and I lead CGIR's function that works to advance gender equity, diversity and inclusion in our global workplaces, or GDI for short. Uh, we in the GDI function, we just very recently celebrated our first birthday. Uh, we were launched in late January 2020 with a very clear mission to work with leadership, management and staff across CGIR uh, to make sure that our workplaces are truly enabling and inclusive for the over 10,000 people who work for CGIR. Our goal is, is to ensure that uh, diversity in all its dimensions is embraced and that everyone feels they have the support they need to reach their full potential. For us in GDI, we know this is not just the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. And that message has been echoed all the way uh, th uh, throughout today from all the speakers that we've heard from, because we know that diversity can bring the different perspectives and, and the innovation we need to deliver on our critical mission. Um, as you may be aware, the work of the GDI function is guided by our framework and our action plan. If you'd like to learn more about what we do, join training programs, read our guides, uh, all of that is available uh, through the GDI webpage and you can see the details on the screen right now. And you're very welcome to come visit us on that page and ask us any questions. Um, among the many initiatives that we've had the honor of supporting in 2020 has been the launch of a new employee-led resource group called WIRES, Women in Research and Science. And WIRES aims to bring together all of us in the global community who seek to support our incredible women scientists, providing them with really supportive and safe spaces to meet and to learn and to grow. Today, we're, we're recognizing the significant contributions of women scientists by showcasing just a sample of their exciting and innovative work. Um, as we continue on our 13 hour journey now, we remind you of a few housekeeping rules that you can see on the screen. We invite you to submit your questions and your comments via the Q&A box. And please do feel free to reach out to Thomas if you have any technical difficulties. We also invite you to join the WIRES group using the contact details on the right hand side of your screen. All that's left for me to do now is to once again congratulate our Africa Rice colleagues. It was absolutely lovely to have your presentations. We've learned such a lot. And it's now my great pleasure to welcome the speakers for our 12th Power Hour of the Day, which is being hosted by IFPRI, handing over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Um, welcome to the penultimate hour of CGIAR WIRES Marathon event on the occasion of International Day of Women and Girls in Science. I'm Dr. Musna Alvi. I'm research fellow at IFPRI and I'm the IFPRI's, I'm IFPRI's WIRES representative based in India. Today we will be hearing from senior IFPRI researchers who are among the leading researchers in their field globally, as well as from their daughters who have also embarked on careers in research and science. 
It gives me great pleasure to be moderating this event. We have an exciting and amazing panel of women scientists with us today. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome Dr. Ruth Meinzendick, who's a senior research fellow at IFPRI. She has over 30 years experience in transdisciplinary research with over 150 peer reviewed publications. She is a recipient of the Eleanor Ostrom Senior Scholar Award on Collective Governance of the Commons. And we are also joined by her daughter, Laura Mindset Dick, who is a PhD candidate in Agriculture and Resource Economics at UC Davis. Also joining us is Dr. Jemima Njuki, IFPRI Director for the Africa Region. Uh, Jemima has more than 20 years of experience in the agriculture sector in Africa and Asia with a particular focus on women's empowerment. Um, she has previously held senior positions with IDRC and ILRI and is recipient of the 2017 Aspen New Voices Fellowship. With her today is her daughter Tamara Muthoni, who is just about to finish high school and is planning to pursue a career in medicine. And finally, we are joined by Dr. Marie Ruel, a director of IFPRI's Poverty Health and Nutrition Division. Marie has more than two decades of experience working on food insecurity and nutrition challenges and poverty. In 2019, she was awarded the American Society for Nutrition's Kellogg Prize for Lifetime Achievement. We are also delighted to welcome her daughters, Dr. Julie Ruel Bergeron, who works at the World Bank Global Financing Facility, and Sarah Ruel Bergeron, who is an architect and executive director at Archive Global. A warm welcome to all of you. And let's get right into it. So this, the, the mode of this session is going to be very conversational. We're going to be hearing from the scientists. We're going to be hearing from their daughters slash scientists. Uh, so let's get right into it. Marie, my first question is for you. Could you tell us um, a little bit about your field of research and how the focus of your research on nutrition has evolved over the years in response to new and emerging challenges in this field? Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so my uh, just a short story uh, is that I am a nutritionist and I came to IFPRI in 1996, that's almost 25 years ago, um, after spending six years working and living in Guatemala where I was working in a nutrition institute for Central America. So when I came to IFPRI, I was the only nutritionist in the institute. There had been a few before, but they, I don't know if they didn't survive or they were not there anymore. Um, and so I came to a team of economists, uh, geographer, political economy experts, and there was some work in nutrition that was done at the time. You probably know the work of um, people like Per Pinstrup Anderson, Joachim von Braun, and Lawrence Sadad, who had all played a little bit with nutrition. Um, the, the kind of work that they were doing at the time uh, was using nutrition as an outcome. So uh, they were interested in understanding the impact of different development programs, initiatives, and, and investments in agriculture, among others, but also social protection programs and, and other kinds of investments in development and see what the impact was on child stunting. So uh, they focused at the time quite a bit on child stunting and this was their main outcome and their main uh, interest in nutrition. Uh, and it was understandable because they had worked for a long time at looking at, at documenting impact of, of their work on poverty and on food security. And those are really much more complex indicators to create than just measuring a child and having a measurement that, uh, that moves. Uh, it's, it's really associated very closely with poverty and food insecurity. So it was a good indicator, but um, I was obviously not happy that nutrition was treated that way. Nutrition is not just an indicator, it's, it's a whole area. <laughs> And uh, there's the nutrition of many members of the family that's important. And there are life cycle stages. And I just thought, okay, we need to do something here so that nutrition becomes mainstream or really um, a science in itself that contributes to the CG. Um, so the first thing I did was to say, well, I need more people. Uh, I cannot do it alone. So that, that is one big message for everyone. Don't try to do it alone. One person is not going to do the trick. And so I think we managed to hire about three people over five years. We needed funding, of course. And, and I hired 
uh, some people that uh, help me create more of a critical mass, if you want. And um, and these people changed over time, and and eventually we grew. But but it took a really long time for nutrition to become such an important aspect of, of our work and to and to have a really big team. Uh, right now, in the division that I manage, we are we have as many nutritionists as economists, senior researchers. So. Uh, things have changed. And what we managed to achieve by having more people is that when people think about nutrition now, they know that if they want an impact on nutrition, they have to have an objective of improving nutrition and they have to have an intervention. So I have repeated over and over, don't just look at whether agriculture improves nutrition. If you don't do anything else than just do agriculture, it's not going to improve nutrition by magic. It's, it's a much more complex set of issues that need to happen or set of interventions that need to happen for nutrition to improve. And so in my division and now more and more so in, in, in IFPRI as a whole, we've, we've really thought through what are the types of interventions that we should combine with agriculture to make agriculture have more impact on nutrition. And so going on and on with this kind of approach of, of giving nutrition the attention it deserves, uh, thinking through uh, what else could agriculture do to improve nutrition. So the kinds of things we've, we've embedded or combined with nutrition are uh, education, behavior change, communication. So a mother doesn't only produce food, like in an agricultural program, if a mother or a woman learns uh, how to grow more food that is diverse, she also has to learn to use it for her family, to feed her family. And so this behavior change communication that we incorporated with agriculture was really a good way to not just stop at the production side, but also ensure that the, the, the consumption of healthy foods was, was achieved. And I think the other thing that we um, managed to uh, change the culture at IFPRI in, in terms of nutrition is also the fact that there are many different indicators of nutrition and they have to choose the right ones. Um, so, you know, with, with a lot of years of working on agriculture and nutrition, what we've realized is that uh, this is not the best objective is not to reduce child stunting, because for reducing child stunting, you need better uh, caring practices, you need better hygiene, you need uh, that the children have less infection, that they go to the health services. So why doesn't agriculture and now food system focus on improving diets. This is the one thing they can do. They produce food and food, healthy food can help people have a better diet. So now the, the work has also changed from agriculture to food systems. Everybody talks about food systems, but in the context of food systems for nutrition, we are looking at diets. We are, we're looking at some outcomes of overweight and obesity, not just child stunting, but maternal anemia as well, maternal uh, nutritional status and all of that. So this is, I feel that we have gone a really, really long way with nutrition in, 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 at IFPRI and, and we're transferring all of this knowledge now to the new CGIAR and, and hoping to have uh, even more impact at, at, a, at a larger scale by incorporating more nutrition in the work of the whole CGIAR. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. And thank you so much for highlighting how our, our research needs to be pliable and, and respond to new challenges, which brings me to my next question for Ruth. Um, Ruth, like everyone else, the pandemic has shifted the way we work and what we work on. Could you reflect especially on how your research trajectory and the topics that you work on have changed over this last year in response to the pandemic and how you see it changing even further, you know, at least in the medium term going forward? Sure, thanks. A major theme of my work, uh, my research is on how people manage natural resources, especially water. Another big theme is on gender issues in rural development, and especially what contributes to women's empowerment. I was just starting a really exciting big project in India where we were trying out new 
experimental games as a way of social learning for people to improve water management. And then COVID. Uh, so quickly had to learn how to do an online workshop. And I work with the most amazing NGO there, Foundation for Ecological Security. And they actually were able to get a lot done in terms of training people safely with hybrid modes and everything. But I didn't get to go to the field. And I love field work. It's where I get my most, my best insights. Well, that and talking to colleagues. But, and it's also a great way to get to know your colleagues. Like Muzna, you and I have had great chances to work together uh, with Self-Employed Women's Association in India. And, and I didn't get to do that either. But what, with the pandemic, it was especially frustrated be, frustrating because we knew that it was really hurting people, but we didn't necessarily know how, especially what are the gender differences in the way it was playing out. And so we switched to doing phone surveys. And I have to give lots of credit to you and your team in, in Delhi for implementing these in India and Nepal, where we we got to at least interview and find out what was going on. We also learned a lot about, there was suddenly this great enthusiasm. Oh, great, we can just do phone surveys in the future. We don't have to do all the expense of, you know, that hot work of going out to the field and meeting somebody face to face. Well, maybe you can't weigh babies remote, but you know, everything else you can do by phone. Mm, not quite so much. You learn what are the systematic biases? P.S. Women are less likely to own phones in, especially in South Asia, and when they they might not even be allowed to use them. So, looking at what are the biases you get from different ways that you are uh, interviewing people um, was really helpful, but I think it was still very useful that we were able to find out what was going on uh, and tell the stories of these women and men, what are the differences, uh, to help draw attention to what are the needs, what, what are the impacts, um, and Part of it was just, it gave me a sense of agency. I didn't feel like I was totally unable to do something to contribute to figuring out what are the best responses to COVID, so. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, and, and that's really interesting. You know, some of these operational challenges with data collection over the phone has been the highlight of my research this last year as well and working with you. So thank you for that shout out. Uh, Jemima, my next question is for you. And this is a big one. Uh, what, according to you, is the one topic of research that merits urgent attention and funding? And what role do you see uh, for women scientists, especially from IFPRI and CGIR in that field? Thank you, Musna. Um, I think what, what comes to mind right now and what we are all talking about really is food systems and how to make sure that our food systems can actually nourish people, that they can actually provide the healthy diets that Marie, uh, Marie was talking about. Um, but even more than that is to ensure that gender equality is woven into food systems because we know the big role that women play in production, in processing, in, in making decisions about household consumption, in looking after the nutrition of children and their families and, 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 and their communities. And so this has to be such a critical part part of it. I say food systems and gender equality are twins because they've got to go, uh, they've got to go together. And this is where I also think that the CGIR has such a critical role to play because it brings different kinds of research 
that actually contribute to food systems. So if you think about food systems, not just as, as, as production, but it's also protecting the environment. It's making sure that, that farmers have the right seed and the right inputs and the right agronomic practices. It's making sure that, that there's markets for this food and that it's moving from where it is being produced to where it needs to be, it needs to be consumed. And this, the, the women in the CGIR centers, and we've already seen, I joined in just as, as the team working on breeding at Africa Rise was speaking, um, the, the, the women scientists who are working on genetic improvement and making sure that crops being bred actually include the characteristics that women want in, in, in these crops, whether it is cooking time, whether it is marketability, whether it's, um, it's, it's high yielding. Um, the ones that are working on agronomy and, and climate smart agricultural, agricultural practices, the ones that are working on market research and policy research, and this is where it's also important to really think about science in, in its broadest sense, to bring in the researchers working on understanding behavior, you know, what, what, what behavior needs to change so that food systems actually are healthy. How do we create demand for healthy, healthy foods? Because if we create demand for healthy foods, then there's actually a pool for production of these healthy uh, healthy foods. So thinking about the scientists, not just in terms of those that are working on the physical, the biophysical sciences, but also those are contributing to the social, to understanding the social dynamics of the, of food systems. And one of the things that I love about working in the CGIR, because I just got back to the CGIR four months ago after being away for about nine years, is the fact that all these scientists are in-house. And if you think about all the other partnerships we have with, with national, um, national partners, then you start thinking, yes, the, the issue of food systems, it's big, it's a huge task, but we really have the capacity to transform our food system so that we, can, we, we stop talking about these 2 billion people that still cannot access uh, nutritious, nutritious foods. It's really within our our grasp right now. We just need the political will and the right investments to make this to make this happen. And not to forget the twin, gender equality and food systems. We really have to go together. We know they are highly correlated, and so we must work at reducing gender inequalities if we want our food systems. Uh, to be equitable, to nourish people, to, 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 to protect um, our environment. Thank you. Thank you, Jemima. And really, the day today has been uh, a showcase of the breadth of talent that CGIR has. Uh, we've heard from you know, sort of people, scientists who are working across the field from behavior to pure sciences to uh, social sciences. And, and so that's really, I, I fully agree with what you've said. Um, you all have lived and done research in different countries, geographies, and cultural environments that not, that's not necessarily home for you. And, and we'd love to hear what that experience has been like. Marie, could you especially reflect on how the perception and reception of women scientists and the work they do has changed within IFPRI and the CGIR uh, in the time that you've been here? Um, I, um, well, first of all, uh, I am a nutritionist and, you know, the world of nutrition is, is populated by women. So we have, we have a very different setup and, um, and it, it, for us, it's kind of the opposite challenge. We need to hire a few men nutritionists, you know, so that we don't just have women. And, uh, but um, just, uh, just my experience at IFPRI uh, in, in my division with the hiring that we've been doing over time, uh, I have to say that the pool, we, we usually hire uh, people at the level of postdoctoral fellow, and then we hope that we will manage to keep them on and, and all the way to, to being leaders in, in the division. And, uh, and we've had a lot of those, uh, but interestingly, our pool of candidates when we hire postdoctoral fellows now is a lot, lot more, there are lots and lot more women 
totally qualified, of course, and, and, and eager to work in, in the CG and to work at IFPRI in this case. And so that has changed enormously. We, and we're very happy with hiring uh, women economists. And uh, we have many that are an example of they stay on, they're good, they're fantastic. And so that, that has changed. At the beginning, it was really mostly a pool of, of men. And as I mentioned before, uh, maybe I didn't mention before that when I, when I came um, 25 years ago, I think uh, there was only one other woman researcher in my division. And, uh, and now, of course, I think we, in my division, I think we had actually more women than men. So Ruth, a similar question for you, but maybe from the point of view of people we work with in the different countries where we have projects, do you see a shift in the way donors and partners see women scientists and then the work that they're doing? Yes, I mean, especially because I started out working in water, even though I, as a sociologist, there's a lot of women in sociology, water is a very, still is a quite, male dominated field. And I was kind of a, what is this creature? Uh, she's not a, a hydrologist and she's not a man. Um, and um, so over the years, I've been meeting more and more amazing women researchers in the field. Like I remember meeting this fabulous Kenyan uh, PhD student, Jemima Njuki, uh, and just being blown away with the insights she was getting. I think as a foreign woman, you often don't have gender because gender is socially defined. And so that enabled me to go back and forth. And so I could go interview men, but I could also be invited into the homestead. And that gave me a lot of really important insights, like about how water is treated separately, men's irrigation and women's domestic, but they're connected and how do we bring them together. So that being able to cross boundaries, I think I used to feel like that I had a disadvantage being a woman. And finally, I realized that no, actually, I have real advantages in being able to cross boundaries and get new kinds of insights. But you mentioned donors. Last year, I was at a workshop and a man from the key donor organization made a point of always calling on a woman to ask the first question, because he said the research is that if a woman asks the first question, more women will speak up. He also used the Gender Avenger Tally app and uh, about who was speaking. And at the end of every session, he'd say, guys, you took up X amount of the airtime and women only got Y amount. Over the course of him using that, suddenly there was more airtime for women to speak up, which I thought it was really important use of his position as a, a donor and a man to speak up on behalf of creating more um, equitable uh, space. The point is that diversity, I really have see it all the time, whether it's disciplinary diversity, gender, backgrounds that we're from, it really enhances the quality of our science. Thank you, Ruth. And thank you for pointing out that, you know, people like us, we're in a position of power to change the narrative, and, and we really should use that power when we can. Um, so that brings me sort of a good segue into the question I have for Jemima. Jemima, you've worked closely with women scientists in Africa and Asia, especially those who are in the national agriculture systems and who work at agriculture universities, who we partner with. Do you see a shift uh, there similar to what Ruth and, and sort of Marie talked about uh, in terms of their work and how they are, are received among their peers in, in the countries in which we work? Um, yeah, the there have been fundamental shifts. So when I started my, my international research career, I actually sat in a, in a national research program in, in Malawi. 
And I, I sort of had the first office in the block. So when you came in, you, I was the first person that you saw. And you cannot imagine how many people would just look at me and ask me where the researchers were because they've come to see the researchers. That, like they never, they walked in and, and they didn't think I could be the researcher. I must have been sitting there like just answering phones and directing people to, to where the, the researchers were. But th this picture has, has, has changed a lot, even within, uh, within national programs. We've seen more research scientists, uh, there are women, We've seen some organizations that are now led by, by, by women scientists, uh, women scientists heading research departments, including biotechnology, engineering, and so on. But unfortunately, that change is not fast enough. It, it's not big enough. So when we look at the statistics, for example, in Africa, we still know that only one in five scientists are women, just about 25%. And only one in seven are in research leadership. So change needs to happen faster and it needs to be much more uh, fundamental. But there's also a lot of things, especially donors and us as international partners can do. We need to get more, especially young women, uh, young women scientists leading projects, being project leaders. This was like my biggest goal when I was in IDRC. I just came from seven years um, leading our agriculture food security programs at, at IDRC, you know, making sure that grants are going to women as project leaders, making sure that even those that are not led by women that actually have about 50%, if not more women, in the research teams because we've got to be intentional about this because if we leave that change to happen organically it's going to take a long time so wherever it is we are sitting we need to be much more intentional about changing that landscape and it's why i'm so proud of programs like like award who are actually just focusing on how do you get more women scientists into leadership uh, into into research leadership and or even organizational leadership uh, positions it's we, we have to be much more intentional and, and deliberate about it thank you thank you jemima and thank you for bringing up the importance of young scientists so let's hear from the young scientists who are with us today uh, we've heard from three amazing ifri scientists and now let's talk to the women that marie jemima and ruth have no doubt inspired through their work and through their lives um, another welcome to the daughters in our who are with us today tamara laurie julie and sarah Sarah, I'd like to start with you. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about the work that you do and in which countries you work and how you manage to sort of integrate your training as an architect uh, with the work that you do in, in sort of the international development uh, sphere? Sure, thank you for the question. I know I'm always the slight oddball as an architect <laughs> amongst this group, um, but uh, I'll start with the introduction of archive and then I'll kind of back up into um, my own personal experience. But, so Archive Global stands for Architecture for Health in Vulnerable Environments. So our work is focused around the idea that housing design is a key preventative strategy in improving health outcomes in vulnerable communities worldwide. We're implementing simple, innovative, cost-effective interventions paired with health awareness trainings and workshops. And we measure the impact of our, that the project has on families participating in our programs. So I always like to put a kind of quick example out there so that people can quickly visualize what we're talking about here. Um, so we are working quite a bit in Bangladesh and we've been replacing existing dirt floors that a lot of families, you guys will all know, eat, work, play and socialize on with a really simple concrete assembly. So our studies show that this relatively modest change, so it's not incredibly cost um, prohibitive and it, it's, you know, can be done on the existing household. Um, that can decrease diarrheal disease, it can decrease respiratory infections, skin irritations, as well as reduce stress and increase the value of the home and property. So those are all important co-benefits. Um, as an organization, we're not disease location or intervention specific. So we're looking for opportunities where designing a simple, local, cost-effective and replicable solution to is able to improve health outcomes. 
So we've worked on malaria in a number of African countries. We worked on tuberculosis and kind of awareness around that in the in London. Um, asthma in the United States, gender-based violence and diarrheal disease in India, menstrual hygiene management in Uganda. And so we're really trying to be opportunistic about what are some of the kind of health problems that we see and what are some design interventions that might address that. And for example, with menstrual health um, management, the idea was to ask the question, can the built environment help or not? We don't always know the answer, but we're always willing to kind of explore these topics in more depth and see where we can kind of um, insert the built environment in a way to, to help. So I'm a licensed architect um, that is fulfilling a childhood dream. Um, and in, so there's architects and then you can go through the process of getting a license in architecture, which is, you know, seven, four hour exams, three years of work. It's quite an intensive process. And in the United States, only 17% um, of licensed individuals are licensed architects are women. Um, so I was also kind of uh, sticking up for, for women in my field by becoming a licensed architect. And, and um, I would say for women in architecture, things are still, um, it's not like nutrition. Uh, it's not all um, women and maybe all supportive women. There's a lot, of, um, a lot of difficulties there, but I'm not so entrenched in that particular field anymore. Um, but so when I, I was six years old, we were living in Guatemala as a family and it was my dream to become an architect. And I was seeing really interesting architecture because we were kind of um, seeing friends' homes and, and visiting and um, there were some really beautiful things happening. And so I think that was part of my inspiration. But I also remember really distinctly that my parents would do field work and they would come back with you know pictures and stories. And it seemed really obvious to me that it didn't matter the types of interventions on nutrition or food security that you did. It wasn't gonna fix, like it wasn't gonna matter if you didn't fix the state of housing. Um, that housing was just so incredibly inadequate. And I didn't have those words at the time, but I could see that housing was so inadequate that it was always gonna be a barrier. And in 2013, I discovered Archive Global, which was encompassing, you know, this kind of these lifelong interests that, that I had had, but not been able to kind of um, fused together because what I'm doing is, is um, not very common in architecture. Um, and so as I've taken on leadership roles in the organization, I've had a strong desire to more fundamentally understand the public health side because I'm a little crippled by being from the design side and not knowing what an IRB is and what proper studies are and um, how to read papers and, and those kind of things. So I'm now um, getting back around to my public uh, public health um, roots within my family, I guess, um, and doing a global um, a certificate in global health practice at Johns Hopkins University to really kind of close that knowledge gap and be able to really speak to both sides because I feel like I'm a little bit kind of crippled only knowing one side of the the kind of solution I'm trying to propose. Thank you. Thank you. It's really fascinating to hear that you took something that you were so passionate about being an architect and, and sort of turned that into something meaningful and impactful. And that's that's really great to hear. Um, I'd like to move on to Tamara. Um, she is a young aspiring scientist about to start a, embark on a career in medicine. Uh, Tamara, is there a as, as you sort of start on, on your journey towards being a scientist, is there a particular anecdote, a story, or word of wisdom you remember from when you were growing up about your mother's research and her career that's really stuck with you and has inspired you in your journey? Um, so a story that I remember my mom telling was one that she told at her Aspen New Voices Fellowship. And it was actually the story about why she wanted to start working with women in the first place. She was at the time studying for her postgraduate degree and she was she went on a trip and then she ended up in a room where she met around 50 plus girls underage girls who were being taken away from situations where they were going to be placed into early marriages or young marriages and she really wanted to find a way to help those girls so that story is what inspired me to or to go into sciences and to study science in university and possibly past university and then hopefully while I'm in university I could minor in something like gender studies because I would also really like to co to contribute to my community the way my mother does. Thank you. That's that's great to hear and all the very best on, on your new journey. Uh, and I'm sure you'll find mentors from across your mom's career who'd be happy to help you, you know, further your interests uh, as, as you go along. Laura, uh, my next question is for you and you're about to finish your PhD. Uh, 
Uh, could you tell us a bit more about your PhD research and what was your inspiration for a career in science? Uh, and a similar question, how did your mother's career shape those choices and the work that you do? Thanks. Uh, so the connection is pretty clear um, down to even the subfield. I'm really interested in property rights and a lot of my research looks at uh, property rights systems in sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, the, the inspiration from my mom is a pretty direct line. Um, when I was a kid, even at three years old, when, when I was asked what I wanted to do, my answer was always, I want to be a sociologist and a ballet teacher. Um, and I don't know that I necessarily understood what that really entailed um, at the time. But as I as I grew older and started to learn more about what my mom did for her work and and what the social sciences entailed and then my like developed my own interests and and learned about who I was as as a scientist and a scholar, it just was such a natural fit um, learning about people and you know endlessly fascinated by human relationships and, and understanding those and so. Um, the line is pretty clear there. And then even, um, although she sometimes says that I've gone to the dark side by becoming an economist instead of a sociologist, um, that, that also has stemmed quite a bit from her experiences in the field and, and understanding the, the power that economics has in shaping the world, um, both you know, in terms of the, the theoretical and then also the, the less pleasant parts of the, um, the dynamics of the field that we work in that, that economists have a lot of power. And so um, going into economics and learning that vocabulary and, and hopefully being able to change it from within a little bit. Thank you, thank you, Laura. Uh, Julie, like your mom, you are in the field of nutrition. In fact, actually like your father as well. Could you tell us about the work that you do in this field and how you got interested by a career in international nutrition? Yeah, thank you. And I'm glad to hear Laura's experience and to see that, you know, I'm not the only one who follows in their parents footsteps. So clearly there's, uh, <laughs> there's more of us out there. So that's nice to see. Um, so thank you for the question was not in um, as per the introduction that was given, I am currently a nutrition specialist um, with the global financing facility, which is a multi donor trust fund that's housed at the World Bank and in um, this trust fund is focused specifically on um, this, you know, uh, very long acronym that we use reproductive maternal newborn child adolescent health and nutrition so that's RMNCAHN. Um, and this is this is kind of the focus of the, the co financing that we provide to World Bank projects in the countries in which we work. Um, and in this position I do a combination of analytical work which um, involves kind of your more traditional research activities, for example, uh, you know, assessing the, the impact of a certain program or intervention, um, but then also other activities that are more programmatically centered and that are perhaps more qualitative in nature or that are kind of more aligned with um, what we might call implementation research, um, which, which is very common to IFPRI, of course. Um, the other part of my work is centered on direct support to countries. So the GFF is engaged in 36 countries um, around the world. And so that support is typically done at the national level to um, you know, work with governments and provide a kind of technical assistance in the design and implementation of large scale programs that can include nutrition in, in varying ways and to varying degrees. For example, we have some programs that are kind of solely nutrition focused, but then we might have others that are more where, where nutrition is kind of a smaller component of a broader health or social protection or other um, type of program. So um, I think, you know, it, it's, it's been very nice to have this balance um, between research and programs and really having this opportunity to be at the nexus of where science meets implementation. And I, again, I mean, this is, um, you know, I, I just, I'm very closely aligned to, I guess, the work that both of my parents have done because this is, um, I mean, I, I think if Bri has a little bit more of the, the, the research component, but they also, um, at least uh, the PHND division is trying to get um, also at this nexus of, you know, how do we, what does research look like when we're, we're talking about um, implementation and, and I guess, you know, taking it one step further into how do you translate that research in a way that can be impactful in a programmatic setting and 
Um, I guess the, the part that I do think is unique um, of the opportunity that I get uh, in a World Bank setting is that we're really talking about large scale. So, you know, a lot of the research that is done really focuses on kind of smaller programs and proof of concept. Uh, but then, you know, we're really taking it to kind of a national scale and and, you know, it often falls apart when you do that. So what is it that's going wrong? And how can we better understand what those bottlenecks are so that we can actually um, do what we're all saying we need to do, which is to implement at scale, right? Um, so anyway, I, I will use that as a, a segue into the, the question about how I got interested in this career. And, and I think it's, it's very hard to pinpoint, perhaps unlike some of my fellow um, panelists, I, it's maybe not so clear in my mind uh, which which factor contributed how much or, uh, or or which was the determining factor, but I think it's perhaps a combination of things. Um, and and first, um, it goes without saying. Obviously, this is, that's what this panel is about. Uh, but and and my sister mentioned it. We both grew up. Um, in a very nutrition heavy environment, both of our parents were working in this and, um, you know, when I say nutrition heavy, I don't mean that we sat there and analyzed, you know, every meal that we were having, of course, but it's more that it's kind of buzzing around in the background and um, my parents are very social and there were always students and, you know, students who are now, it's so funny to to see them, obviously, I interact with them still in the nutrition world because, you know, I remember them when they were in their, you know, early 30s, um, coming to do some research in Guatemala and staying at our house. And in fact, some of them are, are still in the division. And I won't go into some of the stories that we have with them. But, um, but you know, so nutrition was kind of just always around, and and um, yeah, bo both both of them were working on it. And so, you know, it just kind of becomes part of the conversation and part of the environment. Um, maybe this is like the subliminal messaging that 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 took its course. Um, and then the second, of course, again, is that we were lucky that we did get to spend time abroad. Um, the most significant period of that was in Latin America and Guatemala. And I think that similar to similarly to my sister, this ingrained kind of a love and appreciation for cultures that are different from our own. Um, starting from a very young age, and then that continued to get reinforced through our childhood as we were, um, you know, we had the luxury of parents who were very adventurous and who wanted to take us to new places and try new foods and see other cultures and see the world. And so I think that's maybe where the international interest um, stemmed from. And then as I got older, I navigated through different types of courses in my undergraduate and graduate programs and and there always seemed to be this natural gravitation towards nutrition even if it wasn't my my area of study until I went and did a PhD so um, you know I think there were important reinforcements and opportunities along the way I was a nutrition counselor for um, kind of the US flagship nutrition program for women women infants and children it's called the WIC program um, so that was, you know, my, my job when I was 25 years old and I was essentially doing, you know, what a community health worker does in rural somewhere. Um, and, and then, you know, continuing on, I was able to work with a sister CG center, Harvest Plus, that's where I did my master's research on their um, orange flesh sweet potato project. And, and I just remember, you know, loving, a, kind of similar to what Ruth was saying. I mean, I, I also love field work and um, I think the logistics of it, because I have a family now, are a little bit more complicated, but I, you know, you just learn so much. And when I was doing this um, orange flesh sweet potato work, it was, I was doing um, standardized recipes. And, and yeah, I just found it fascinating to learn. And, you know, you're kind of among these women who are making their, you know, version of a tomato sauce with dried fish or whatever, and you measure every little thing. And um, it just was really kind of, you really just feel like you're part of it. And it was so interesting. So I think, you know, over time, finally, when it got to the PhD stage, I said, okay, I'm going to dive in deep, and I'm finally going to do this nutrition thing. And so that's what I ended up um, studying. And, and now I'm very happy that my career continues down that path. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to hear how all of the daughters in our panel have, have somehow been inspired by the work that their mothers do and, and some are even following in their footsteps. Uh, but you've heard enough from me. So let me hand over to the daughters. We've asked each of the daughters to prepare a question for their mother. And I'm, look, I'm looking forward to hearing what they've come up with. Laura, let's start with you. Thanks. Um, 
So as I'm about to graduate this year, uh, I feel like I'm sort of shifting from a, a student role, um, a student scientist, if you will, into being more of an independent scholar. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your advice for this transition and, and how do you establish yourself as, as an independent scientist? Interesting, because I think my advice is to find a team where you bring out the best in each other. They, if Pri at one point did a gender audit where they said there was this mode of, of the individual star, which was a very masculine way of being a scientist and the team players. For me, the joy of this is really being part of diverse teams where we bring out the each contribute something and we bring out the best in each other. Find those people. And especially because you are a social person, you don't have to be the bookish nerd who to succeed. To be a real scientist, you can go out and go to the field. You can talk to people. That's good. That's part of being a good scientist and a good researcher. Thanks, Ruth. Tamara, it's over to you. Uh, my question for mom is, why did you choose to go back to research after working in RDRC? Why did you choose to go back to research? Um, that, that's an interesting question. I'm, I'm still not sure I have the, the answer to that. The, I left the CGIR and research back in 2012. And one of the reasons I left was I was I was getting impatient um, with the research. I wanted to see research translating faster into into development outcomes and into changes in people's lives. And I wanted to be seeing that sort of almost in in real time. So I actually first moved to care. Um, Care USA to, to start their women in agriculture program. Then I thought that scale was still too small that I actually now wanted to, to make decisions about where the money went so that we could do this at an even bigger scale so that we could put more money into, into gender equality work. And then I'm back to research. And the reason why I'm back in research is it, it's such an opportune moment to actually be in the region and, and focused on Africa. We have about four or five years now to the end of what governments committed, uh, African governments committed in the, in the Malabo Declaration. Um, about having poverty, reducing malnutrition, reducing post-harvest losses. And then you start realizing how much research is gonna, how, what a huge role research is gonna play in that. What a huge role the research that IFPRI does is gonna play in, in making that happen. So it's not just that I came back to research, but I came back to a specific organization and a specific kind of research that I know is so much needed in the, in the, in, in the continent. And as we do this, to really also be saying to governments, we can't do this while leaving women, uh, women behind. So I, I sort of have a very specific, um, purpose in, in coming back to research at this particular time and in coming to IFPRI at this particular time. Thank you. Thank you, Jemima. I think I echo everyone's uh, thoughts in IFPRI when I say that we are very glad to have you. Uh, and we are really excited to see the research that, that, that will be coming out of the region under your leadership. Um, uh, the floor is Sarah and Julie's for their question for their mom. Yeah, so I it wasn't we were we were presented as sisters, but it's important to say that we're twins. So everything has to be split exactly evenly. So we have kind of a, a two part question and I'll do the first part and Sarah will continue. We'll compliment. Um, so the question is, has being a mother or even a grandmother now changed your research interests or your perspective about how to interact with your career? 
And so I'll follow up and say that Julie and I have talked about this um, in some detail. And, you know, I think we're both kind of um, new mothers, Julie more, more veteran than myself, but still kind of just a few years in. And we talked about some of the more immediate impacts motherhood has had on us and our work. So from a feeling of how important the work that we do is to creating a more fundamental understanding of the challenges that mothers face you know, in, in our work and how we can tune our work better to respond to those. But we were thinking that you may have more of a career's worth perspective of um, motherhood and its impact on your work. Yeah, I'm not too sure which way to address the question, actually. Um, certainly, like, uh, like Julie, I, I know uh, I was extremely interested in infant and young child feeding when I was when I had um, uh, the twins, I, I actually started my PhD. I did one year of PhD and boom, I was pregnant with twins. So this was a little bit of a challenge. Uh, but yeah, I was very interested in learning more about infant and young child feeding practices. But in terms of how um, it affected my career, I think it is really a good question because I was young and not really thinking very much about, you know, how are, how are we going to do this? We're, we, not only did we get a child, we got two and I have a PhD to finish and so does my husband. And so I think that um, the way we made it work really was to not worry about it and to just say, well, yeah, of course we can do this. And uh, the one thing I remember very well that I could not do, you know, in Cornell and then Ruth, you've been there, um, there's, there's this, uh, I can't remember the, the name of the cafe in, in this building, I'm sure you remember, but you know, men uh, who had children would spend a lot of time chatting there, drinking coffee and chatting and you know, leaving late and everything. And I was just like, no time for that. And, you know, I was doing the morning shift, Jill was doing the afternoon shift and there was no time for that. And I think I've seen that in Julie as well, that there is no time and there's not as much time for the socializa socialization when you have to go back to kids at home. But I didn't miss it. I mean, I was just so excited to go back to the kids at home and it's a fun life. And I've said that to many people that I've never regretted having children right in the middle of my PhD. All my colleague women didn't. They had children later on. It's much more difficult when you have to start traveling for work and when you have a job, you're supposed to be there from nine to eight or whatever. It was actually much easier to fit children, I felt, when I was studying. Than, than, and then when I started traveling, well, it took me a little longer to do the PhD. But when I finished the PhD, my girls were six. And it was okay to travel when the kids are six year olds. You know, I, I, I just didn't, didn't feel like it was so heartbreaking and that I was leaving, you know, this um, incredible amount of work for my husband by leaving. So I've often said, you know, to women who work with me or, or who ask, you know, don't let the, the, your work stop you with your family life. You'll figure it out. You'll work it out. And, and my two daughters are doing now and you're, you're working it out. Thank you, Marie. I, I think I share some of your sentiments about how fun like being a mother can be sometimes. Uh, just today in the morning, I was telling my three-year-old that he's my best friend. And in that moment, I actually really felt that given the time that I've been spending with him, it really feels like we've, we've really bonded over this last year in ways that I hadn't got to do in the first two years of his life when I was, uh, you know, postdoc and traveling and things like that. So, so I completely share your sentiments. We are actually over time, we, 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 we have so much more that we wanted to cover, but I'm going to ask Laura to leave us with some words of advice uh, for young girls who are watching right now, aspiring scientists, um, and advice that they would give, that, that you would give to all of the young girls who are watching who are considering careers in science. Laura, the floor is yours. Thanks so much. So I've been, I've been thinking a lot about this in the past couple of weeks, and um, 
I have a, sort of two related pieces of advice and both have to do with the stereotypes that we have about what it means to be a scientist. So there's a big stereotype that, that scientists are only good at the hard skills. And I think that there's often a pressure on young girls that if you are good at the soft skills, the, the sort of people skills, then you sort of get pushed away from the hard sciences. And, and I want to encourage young girls who are, who are interested in science to not underestimate their math and science skills that actually having both makes you a better scientist. And, and we do really need that. And with that, we also really need passion. There's sort of this idea of scientists as being very disconnected and, and sort of aloof from their research. But if we're changing the world, if we're aiming to, to do science to make the world a better place, we really should care about what we're doing um, and bring that passion to it. And um, that, that trying to disconnect your emotions from your work uh, it doesn't necessarily make your work better. So. Uh, that's that's my advice for for young girls and uh, yeah. Thank you. And with that, we end our session today. Um, I, I leave you with these images of IFPRI women in the field. You can also watch that on IFPRI's um, Twitter feed. Uh, and, and thank you so much to all of our panelists. Special thanks to all of the daughters for coming here and sharing your views and sharing you know, your life story and your inspiration. Um, and, and we hope to continue to hear more of, from you and about your work. Um, and with that, I hand over back to Fiona. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much to, to Marie, to Jemima, to Tamara, to Ruth, Julie, Sarah, Laura, and especially Musna for, for steering us through a really enjoyable and enlightening session. Um, I have a whole bunch of questions, a whole load of things I really want to say to these amazing women. I have a whole page of notes here, but I'm conscious that we're a few minutes over. So what I will say is, I wish we had more time with you. <laughs> We need to somehow get more time with you. We truly appreciate your commitment and the time that you have taken to be with us today. Uh, I know that many of the oh, well over 100 people who are online right now probably have as many questions as I do, but don't worry, we couldn't fit them in today. We will find a way of gathering those questions and continuing this conversation again outside of today's event. Um, I'm conscious of the time. So what I will say is thank you so much. It was unique and lovely to welcome two generations of amazing women who are related in the one call. It's something I will personally take away and I know a lot of other colleagues will too. Um, congratulations. Thank you so much. And now it's time to move to Simit. <laughs>